This is the story of the most advanced space launch rocket engine ever built. Specifically this one, the one that wasn't even lit during Starship flight test number four. Is it appropriate to call you the godfather of the Raptor engine? Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's appropriate or not. Um, I was lucky enough to be the person that got to start that program at SpaceX, but that program certainly felt like one of my children. Each Starship Raptor engine costs around $2 million to manufacture, and while SpaceX aims to reduce that to a quarter million, the reality is you're looking at $66 million worth of engines soaring across the sky as they boost the Starship toward orbit. If you're not familiar with Starship, put simply, it's the most powerful launch system ever built, capable of putting so much tonnage into orbit that it would be a huge deal even if it wasn't going to be reusable. But being reusable translates into being affordable and accessible by commercial businesses. It's a two-stage system, and the toughest problem SpaceX is trying to solve is making the second stage truly reusable. This video is not going to go too much into the second stage because I want to talk about the first stage, also known as the Super Heavy Booster, and one of its 33 Raptor engines that was not firing during flight test number four. This happened on June 6th, 2024. So why does the Starship have so many first stage engines when other orbital rockets have two or five or nine? The Saturn V job was to bring humanity to the moon, and it was incredibly powerful, capable of launching an entire lunar descent and return system, including a drivable car. But can you imagine what would happen if the Saturn V had an engine failure like this Starship Raptor engine did? The Saturn V did have some engine issues during its flights, but overall had a good safety record, successfully flying 13 times, including 10 times with people. Remember, this isn't a reusable system, so 13 flights means 13 brand new rockets, each with a set of five gigantic F-1 engines on the first stage. This is in stark contrast to what SpaceX is doing. So with the Starship first stage, the propulsion system has the strength of many. Having more engines is an engineering trade-off, most obviously adding more places where you can even have a failure in the first place. This also adds additional complexity to the fluid flow systems that have the job of getting all that propellant to all those engines. But this trade-off prioritizes mission success in the event of an engine failure. This vehicle is expected to have thousands and millions of flights. The chances are very close to zero that there will never ever be an engine failure during liftoff. While Saturn V's first stage would lose one-fifth of its thrust capability in the event of an F1 failure, the Starship's first stage loses only 1 33rd of its thrust capability if a Raptor fails. If this happens on an airliner, first you thank the stars that your vehicle has wings that provide lift, and then the pilots take action to compensate and keep control of the aircraft. When this happens during a space launch, the computers controlling the engines try very hard to produce enough total thrust to achieve orbit, while keeping the thrust output as balanced as possible. Does it make you sad or is there emotions when you see a Raptor engine not firing? Or are you just like, hey, this is a test program and they're, they're running it through its paces and this is awesome? I think it's very much the latter. Um, it's a test program. You want to see things fail. You want to learn things. You never learn as much from your successes as you do your failures. And that often gets said nowadays, especially in the space industry. But I think it goes to the robustness of what they're developing from a vehicle system standpoint. You've got that many engines on the on the first stage, you know, things can happen. And we've seen that in their development phase. So I think it's great that they're seeing, one, how, how the engine's um, health monitoring systems work, that they're adequately shutting things down, that there's not a propagation of failure from one engine to the adjacent engines. Um, I think it really all goes to, like I said, the robustness of their system and what they're developing and their understanding of how these engines can work together. Here's the real kicker for me, though. This engine is heavy. After it stopped working, you now have a $2 million piece of dead weight just soaring through the sky. All of the other engines are working hard to lift the weight of that engine that's not doing its part. So this was flight four, right? Flight one was famous for lifting multiple engines worth of dead weight, and I have no idea how much the flight computer was freaking out during these insane moments, but I know I was freaking out far more than I should have been for someone watching from home. 
The early shutdown of engines during this Flight 1 is believed to be caused by the concrete launch pad underneath the Super Heavy booster becoming partially vaporized during the initial seconds of the launch, resulting in debris being flown upwards at the nozzles of the Raptor engines. After Flight 1, SpaceX installed a water-cooled steel plate beneath the Super Heavy launch mount. It has a system of channels through which water is pumped at high pressure, and the water flows through the plate and is released underneath the rocket as a powerful deluge creating a barrier between the exhaust plume and the launch pad. This water prevents the plate from melting, warping, or being ejected as debris. Trying to get away with not using a water deluge system is fascinating. I mean, some compare it to a child experimenting with a toy rocket. But in reality, this is speed. It's just one of the many examples of their commitment to rapid iteration. And let's not forget about the previous test flights that only had three Raptors, sure, but they were firing at that same concrete and they did not have this issue. Yes, it would have been nice to not need a water deluge system, but Flight 1 proved that 33 Raptor engines do break up and eject concrete. The data they gathered from this will surely be taken into account when building a launch and landing pad on the Moon and Mars and other places for Starship. sit here at home, I try to imagine what it would be like to work on this project in a position of responsibility, knowing that $66 million of engines are going to explode or end up in the Gulf of Mexico at the end of the test flight. And thinking about it like this, it starts to make sense why you would lose sleep over a program like this, right? Like it starts to make sense why there are so many traditional aerospace companies that don't do it like this. They don't do the rapid prototyping thing, and they're not willing to take the risks that SpaceX is. There's two things I learned in my time at SpaceX that, that most ex-SpaceXers can't ever not pay attention to again. You learn how much time it should really take to do a complicated engineering task and how many people of the right people it should really take to do a task. You know, at SpaceX, I got to work with some of the brightest minds in the industry. And, you know, once you know what people are capable of and how that can be done, it unlocks timeframes and costs that people don't think are possible. And it's important to remind ourselves that while this program burns cash, moves fast, and blows things up, its purpose is to establish a technology that does the opposite of that. The whole idea with Starship is to push humanity's launch capabilities further by leaps and bounds so that we can get humans to Mars, and in the process, open up broader, game-changing access to space. And to that end, SpaceX is going to attempt the unthinkable. So a lot of people are going to watch this right before Flight 5, but many more probably will watch it after Flight 5, before Flight 6. Are you psyched about seeing a booster not land on the ground, but come back and actually get cradled with the arms of a tower as it comes back for rapid reusability? I am completely psyched to see that. I have friends and acquaintances that worked on that tower and those chopsticks and Mechazilla, you know, they're totally stoked because that was their creation. You know, can you imagine, you know, now you're taking the logistics of what Falcon 9 has to do with recovering it and transporting it and moving it around. And every time you touch something that complex, you risk damaging it. And to bring the booster back to its tower... Um, it's all in line with the ConOps vision, which is capture it, set it to the side, refuel it, launch it again. And from an engine standpoint, the full flow stage combustion cycle was developed by the Air Force and NASA specifically to unlock more levels of reusability. So Raptor is the ideal engine to be paired with that type of ConOps for Starship and Starship Booster to be caught and refilled and launched again. So yeah, I'm excited to see it because that's, I remember when we were talking about Falcon 9 boosters coming back towards land for the first time. Because imagine, imagine the national security complex having this conversation where, you know, we spent decades in the Cold War preventing inbound missiles. And now a company is saying, hey, we want to launch our rocket. And then at first, we just want to bring the boost stage back. And we want to fly it right back at Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center. And then, you know, we'll light the engine and we'll land it and it'll be great. <clears throat> and so, I mean, if you frame it like that, that was kind of what that early era was like when we were developing Falcon 9, Falcon 9 reusable booster. And I, people were nervous. And now people go and flock to watch these things come in. And 
the team at SpaceX, the GNC team specifically, I mean, they just crushed that whole development of being able to bring that back along with the propulsion team and the component hardware folks and everybody a part of that process. So now you're taking that to the 11 with capture it and set it down off the tower. Um, I'm sure there'll be high pucker factor, but it'll be awesome when it happens. So why did I want to talk about flight number four and the one engine that wasn't firing during most of the mission and presumably failed? you know, during the first few seconds. The reason is because it's a great way to get into the bigger picture conversation. Gathering data and learning was the goal of the mission and losing $2 million or even the entire set of first stage engines that cost $66 million is insignificant when comparing that to the entire program as a whole and the goals that it's trying to achieve. Starship is the freight train to space and if successful, will bring immeasurable value to the entire human race. What are the chances you think of Starship really achieving rapid reusability versus the reset and refurbish, take weeks and months um, approach that the space shuttle had? I think it's gonna happen. And, and I think you don't have to really look in any further than the data points we already have. Compare the launch rate of the SLS rocket and its cost to what's going on with Starship and Starship Booster right now and how rapid now they're flying. And people can say, well, it's not, they're not reusing anything yet. Um, I would point to the last mission where, you know, they landed the booster in the ocean stably and, and recovered, you know, the Starship vehicle. And it's got some issues to still work through, but a vehicle of that size is unprecedented. This is the largest rocket ever produced and because of the experience on Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, they're already pushing the envelope of understanding of reusability. It's one of the hardest engineering challenges for sure, because when you, when you look at the energy required to be orbital, and you have to bleed that energy off to recover that vehicle, and yeah, they're having to you know, learn about you know, tiles and other thermal protection systems, and that adds weight, and they're gonna have to do some optimization. Um, but SpaceX has been thinking about this problem for a long time. And I think the reason they'll be successful is because they're willing to try new things in new ways that I think sometimes organizations discount because they think they know something, but I think they sometimes lean too heavy into what they think is true versus going to find out if it's true or not. And time and time again, SpaceX has gone and tested things and found out new information um, that's led to uh, these rapid advancements in capability. I mean, honestly, the Falcon Heavy launch where two boosters came back and landed at the Cape is still one of the most phenomenal videos and feats of engineering, second only to the moon landing in terms of aerospace, in my opinion. And people discounted that that would ever be a reality. And I put this whole Starship conversation in the same category of it's not if, it's when, and when will be as fast as they can continue to launch and learn and field the vehicle. I want to thank Jeff Thornburg so much for coming on and talking about the Raptor engine. And I want to thank you for watching. Later on, I'm going to post the full discussion I had with Jeff on Patreon and for YouTube channel members, for those who want to dive deeper into the interesting stories of early Raptor development. If you're just getting into spaceflight, feel free to ask any questions you may have in the comments. Also, think about sending this to somebody who you think should learn more about Starship and its mighty Raptor engines. Open your mind and reach for the stars.